All right, guys, welcome to spring term 2020, coronavirus quarantine, remote instruction version of your college education. Uh, this is Liberalism and its Critics, Poly Sci 42. Uh, you're seeing me here in my dining room where I actually do have a chalkboard. I'm gonna keep on the chalkboard the thing that I started a couple weeks ago, the self-quarantine count up. I'm on day 15. Uh, I have left the house to go get groceries and uh, essential supplies, but uh, my kids haven't seen any of their friends. We have had no contact with anybody except for being six feet away from them out on the street taking walks. So that's our self-quarantine situation. I'm not gonna dwell on it too much. Uh, you all know what's going on uh, with you, and uh, this is the adventure that we're on right now is remote instruction. So today, for the first lecture <coughs> in this class, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically lay out what it is that liberalism is, uh, and it's not a specific ideology. Liberalism is a set of ideas, and I, and I call it a, a family of ideas. So what's the liberal family of ideas? In the first part of this course, we're going to explore the different versions of uh, liberalism, the different set of the, or all the different uh, manifestations of this set of family ideas. And then the second part of the course, we're going to look at the critics. So today I'm going to talk about the different categories, essentially, of liberalism and what liberalism is in general. And just in case you're wondering, this is an hour and 50 minute class, but I'm not going to deliver an hour and 50 minute lecture. Uh, the lecture lengths are going to be different times depending on what I have to cover. And uh, it could be an hour, it could be an hour and 20 minutes, it could be 45 minutes, I really don't know. They're all gonna be different. And I'm just going to make sure that it's less than an hour and 15 minutes for sure. So that's what's coming up. <clears throat> and um, if you have any questions or you have any interest in uh, video conferencing with me, send me an email, jack.miller at pdx.edu, and we can set up a phone call or we can set up a Zoom meeting uh, and we can connect in you know, that human way that is actually now the appropriate social distancing way. So, the liberal family of ideas. Liberalism itself is a relatively straightforward concept, and that concept is that the, prim the primary value that is to be manifested in whatever kind of system you're putting together, or what ki whatever kind of lifestyle, or whatever kind of viewpoint, the primary value is liberty. It doesn't mean that liberty is the only value, uh, and it doesn't mean that it's liberty or nothing else, which is obviously this, a different way of saying the only value. It means that when there are value conflicts, when there are two things that uh, either a political system or you as a person or an organization uh, uh, think are important, like for example, equality, it's just that if you're a liberal in this capital L sense of the word, if you're part of this liberal family of ideas, if there's a conflict, if you can't have liberty and equality at the same time for whatever particular reason, and we'll definitely in this class talk about when we see these value conflicts happening, because uh, they happen all the time, liberty takes priority. Uh, it doesn't mean that liberty is always the only thing being manifested. It just means that when there's a conflict, liberty is going to uh, take precedence. Now, what is liberty? What does that idea mean? How is that value, when it's prioritized over other things, how is it supposed to be manifested? What does it look like? What is its shape? What is it not? Uh, <clears throat> that question I'm actually going to put off <laughs> until uh, next time because uh, that actually deserves a pretty big drill down uh, and I can discuss the liberal family of ideas without necessarily providing a specific definition. And in fact, there is no specific definition. Part of what happens with the liberal family of ideas is that different uh, advocates, people working with different uh, uh, perspectives and different domains are going to view liberty uh, with different definitions. So we're going to definitely get to that question of, well, what is liberty exactly that we're prioritizing? But just know that that's what liberalism is. Liberty is the primary value. Uh, <clears throat> and it's going to be a case where 
there's all kinds of tough choices that have to get made. And part of what the critics that we're going to look at are going to point out when they actually uh, get to, when we actually get to that part of the class, is that liberty shouldn't always be the primary value. That's going to be one of the arguments. Uh, very few people say that liberty is a bad thing. There are, in fact, actually critics who say that liberty is not only shouldn't be the primary value, that it's actually a problem, that it, uh, that it should be... Uh, um, gotten rid of or ignored or set to the side. We'll, we'll actually see a couple of people who say that. But almost everybody who will read accepts that liberty is a good thing. It's just not the goodest of all things. It shouldn't necessarily be the primary value. And when you make it the primary value in one or more domains, in the political domain, the economic domain, the societal domain, uh, international domain, the, the claim is going to be that that creates bigger problems than it uh, than it benefits that it gives. So that's, gonna, that's kind of where some of the dispute comes from. Most thinkers accept that liberty is something that is good, people like it, it has benefits, but uh, it's not necessarily the goodest of all goods, it's not necessarily supposed to be the primary value. Okay, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to move on. It's definitely, I, I will tell you that it's uh, 9.40 in the morning here on Friday uh, before school starts and so maybe my brain is not as jump-started as I thought it was going to be. I felt, felt really like, okay, you're ready to go. Kids are still asleep, teenagers are asleep upstairs, right there. Uh, and I thought, I had a couple cups of coffee, I'm ready to go. We'll see. This, is a, th this whole thing is gonna be uh, a, a, an adventure, a new adventure. I will say that one of the things that, that is difficult for me in this moment right now is that I can't pace. Anybody who's taken a classroom before knows that I'm a pacer. I, I'm kind of confined in, the, in, this, in this smaller space, so it's going to take me a little while to get my chops. All right, liberalism is about liberty being the primary value. What is the liberal family of ideas? The liberal family of ideas is a set of concepts about how liberty should play out in various domains uh, in the world. And what are those domains? Well, um, the domains are the political domain, and we're going to look uh, at first in the class, we're going to look at political liberalism. What does it mean to take the idea of liberty and manifest it in a political system? And that is, in fact, historically the first place that the notion of liberty uh, uh, landed. <clears throat> the Enlightenment idea that we are free, that we are supposed to have the rights of life, liberty, and property, or life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, those are the two different versions of it, uh, either from John Locke or from uh, the Declaration of Independence, which was uh, influenced by John Locke. That idea was meant to be a political idea. That has an impact on how we set up our political system. So political liberalism is uh, how do we accommodate, how do we prioritize, and how do we protect liberty in the political arrangement. So accommodate, And protect liberty. And the kind of primary thing that political liberalism uh, adheres to is that the individual is prior to the political. That there's this notion that we start with free individuals and if we're going to have anything else, if we're going to have a political system at all, it has to start with free individuals who are freely choosing the political system and then the choices within the political system that are made. And that's, a, that's actually a pretty tricky thing. So the idea of political liberalism is that we're going to accommodate and protect liberty, but the free individual is the starting point. The basic concept of political liberalism, the starting point concept, is the notion of the social contract. And that is a key to political liberalism. There is no political system without a contract. Now, just to contrast uh, the liberal view on uh, politics with any other uh, particular view, uh, for example, conservatism. Now, interestingly enough, you would think that conservatism would have come first, conservatism with a capital C, and it actually didn't. 
liberalism with a capital L, the idea that liberty is the central value around which we're going to build our notion of the political world, our notion of the universe, our notion of ourselves, that was actually, it was an Enlightenment notion that was critical of a pre-Enlightenment viewpoint on the relationship between uh, people and society, between individuals and the political system. But there wasn't really a pre-liberal ideology uh, called conservatism that was built around the different notion. But conservatism grew up very quickly as a response to this notion, right, that, that we have free individuals as a starting point. Conservatism with a capital C views society as a natural thing and views the political system as an organic manifestation of a natural social order. And so to conservatism, the notion that we're going to have free individuals as the starting point is just wrong-headed. And there's going to be no social contract. There's no need to create a contract when society is already uh, an organic thing and the political system is a manifestation, an organic uh, outgrowth of the natural social order. So liberalism is already, even before there's a counter ideology of conservatism, liberalism is already taking a pretty uh, controversial and really problematic stand. Why? Like, why is it that we should have a social contract? To liberal thinkers, or especially early liberal thinkers, that why is just a duh. It's like, of course, duh, we should, because if you're going to be ruled by a political system, if there's going to be a government that's going to have power over you, uh, the only way that you can actually say that you are a free person is if you actually freely contracted with that. Now, of course, the contract doesn't have to be an explicit literal one, and so that's actually part of what uh, is tricky for political liberalism, is that if we're going to have a social contract, it's going to be an implied contract almost certainly. In general, in, in relations between individuals, contracts are going to have to be explicit contracts, either verbal, explicitly verbal or actually written down. But uh, the social contract doesn't have to have that nature. Uh, and even when it does have a written down version, like a constitution, uh, the people who are living under that constitution didn't have to write it or sign it or endorse it. Right? Here we are in 2020, we uh, live under the US Constitution, and while it's written down, and we can read it, you can go on the internet right now and read every single word of it, and I would recommend uh, that everybody at some point in their life actually read every word of the US Constitution, especially if you're gonna be, say, President of the United States, that would be a helpful thing, but uh, you can read it, but we didn't sign it, and you might say, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't buy into this thing. You are, according to political liberalism, you are, under certain conditions, bound by this contract, this implied contract, even though you didn't necessarily sign it. Now we'll definitely get into uh, the uh, question of how can a particular contract that you didn't write be uh, generate in your implied consent. That's going to be a really big thing that we're going to talk about when we uh, uh, start looking at what political liberalism is. But the notion behind this is that, we, again, we start with free individuals. There is no society, there's no political system, and we human beings freely create it. And again, that's not the only way to look at a uh, political system. The conservative view, and there are, other, uh, there are others who follow in kind of the classic conservative model, communitarians, fascists, uh, they believe that the thinking of the notion of a political system as a human construct, that is formed through some kind of implied contract is not the correct way of uh, thinking about it. It's, that, that is, it's a misreading of what human life is like. It's a misreading of what a political system is, how it develops. Um, now, obviously, historically, this is a lie, right? There is, there is no social contract that actually gets signed. And one of the biggest devices that gets used by uh, political liberals is the notion of the state of nature, where there is no uh, political system and there's no society, there's just a bunch of free individuals running around. Uh, that's, historically, that doesn't hold up. Uh, and, but it's not meant to hold up historically. The notion here is that this is a, an idea uh, that captures our fundamental place in the world. Uh, the social contract is a construct that is used to express an underlying idea that human beings, 
are fundamentally separate from each other and they are fundamentally liberty loving. They love their own free choice about how to live their lives. And so if we're actually living in a political system, which we all are born into the world living in a political system, uh, then that political system has to abide by the underlying idea of what it would be like if we actually freely chose it. So this is a, it's a, it's a contract, but it's a construct. It's not meant to be a reality. Okay? And this notion is not historical reality either. Call it more of a philosophical reality, right? It is it's an expression of our place in the world. So liberalism, political liberalism is really the first in the family, uh, historically. It's it, it, the, the enlightenment, the birth of liberalism in the enlightenment is born with this notion that human beings are uh, free individuals and separated for, or prior to, philosophically prior to any kind of social or political system. And then that raises the question, how do we build a legitimate political system? And that's what we'll look at when we look at political liberalism. Uh, this all raises a, a question that is bigger than the political. And uh, the, so there's, there's a, uh, another domain, and that's the social. And the social question about liberalism is connected to this one, right? What is the relationship between the individual and society? And actually, this was this would seem to be the first question that should have been asked. Uh, to me, it seemed that way anyway. Uh, as soon as you say, okay, we have, a, we have a bunch of separate individuals who are liberty-loving and have the ability to make free choice and they cut at that uh, ability, the first question for me would have been, of course, I didn't live in the Enlightenment, so I wasn't around to be one of the first people to ask it, but philosophically, it seemed like the first question is, okay, what does that mean in my stance to the rest of society? Uh, political liberalism just says, no, we have, to, like, we have to take account of the fact that people are separate individuals freedom loving and they have capacity of rational uh, free will how do we justify any kind of political order that was historically the first question but prior to that is what is even our relationship to others uh, and one of the things that in the domain of social liberalism is this idea that society is both a necessity for and a threat to the individual. Necessity and threat. And it's a necessity in a variety of ways. Uh, liberals see the world as a collection of separate individuals, but except for the starkest uh, uh, libertarians who, who view that as being the only fundamental truth that we are, all islands, uh, of uh, individuality, the idea that all we are is separate from other people is that's that that's that's too extreme because individuals are born into the world in a one we're dependent for a certain amount of time uh, and two we're born into a world where uh, there are family relations uh, there is a language uh, and we are fundamentally individuals, separate, but we also have important social components. Uh, and just one example of how important a social production is to us as individuals. Uh, one of the most personal things that we have is our inner monologue, right? And like, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm inside my head, like I'm actually in my body here in the room on this video uh, camera talking to you guys, but all of this is coming from my inner monologue. 
and you're sitting there watching this uh, and you're, you have an inner monologue, you're listening, maybe you're thinking about what your grocery list is, maybe you're wondering when the next time you're actually going to get to go to a bar or a party is, uh, that's all your inner monologue. And your inner monologue is an extremely important part of who you are. Right? I, no one has access to it. It's actually a really uh, major way in which we can see that we are separate individuals. Uh, everybody's inner monologue is separate. The only way we can actually connect our inner monologue to other people is through communication of some kind, verbal, visual, body language, whatever it happens to be, but we're, we are fundamentally separated from everybody else. But our inner monologue takes place, for the most part, not 100%, but for the most part it takes place in a language. My inner monologue happens in English, and English is a social production. I didn't invent English, my brain didn't invent English, I had to actually learn it. In order to even have an inner monologue at all, you have to be enmeshed in uh, societal and family relations. You have to learn this thing that's super important to us as individuals. So this is where society is a necessity. This is just one example, right? And obviously, uh, because we're human beings, unlike some animals who are, who are born and they drop out and they just you know, are ready to go about being uh, uh, independent, human beings have a very long period of dependence. And it's during that period of dependence that we learn uh, our inner monologue, we learn all kinds of stuff. So society is a necessity for us to even be individuals in the first place. Uh, and one of the key features of uh, the, the individual uh, is that we are rational, right? And that's actually a big part of what uh, we're gonna do when we accommodate and protect liberty is accept that the social contract has to be a rational expression of our own choices. So we're rational, we don't start off rational. Uh, we, we have to learn rationality, uh, rationality as an instrument, as a tool to help us get more of what we want out of the world. That's, what, that's how liberals see, or at least that's how both political and social liberals see rationality is, it's a tool. We need society to be able to develop our inner monologue, to be able to develop our rational capacities, and so obviously we are not fundamentally separate individuals only. We are separate, our bodies are separate, our inner monologue is separated from other people. Uh, when something happens to me, it happens only to me. Other people might feel empathy, other people might themselves uh, feel all kinds of emotions or have, have certain kinds of rational judgments about something that happens to me. Uh, for example, I'm the you know, head of household in this family and I make dinner every night. If something happened to me, if I get sick, and then of course I'm thinking about potentially being sick, as I think many of you are, uh, I will not be able to make dinner. And so uh, obviously um, we're connected, but when I'm sick, only I am sick. It has consequences for other people. So uh, society is a necessity for us, but it's not the only thing. We are fundamentally separate even at the same time that we are a social production, right? So the necessity is that we are, excuse me, individuals are partly a social production. It's, to me, impossible to even conceive of what I would be like as an individual if it weren't for my inner monologue, which takes place in the English language, which pre-exists me, which is a social production, and uh, I don't have, even now that I speak English and have, have uh, uh, mastered it, I'm not fully in control of it. I learn new uh, slang, I learn new ways of talking, and that not only impacts the way I interact with other people, it impacts my inner monologue as well. So individuals are partly a social production, so society is a necessity for us. We're not lone wolves. But, and this is a really important thing, society, others, don't, don't, I don't want to make this seem like society in this big sense, but other people, that's what I mean by society when I'm talking about uh, the threat, other people are a threat to our individualism, right? Other people will want us to make certain choices that maybe we don't want to make. Uh, other people uh, see us as, excuse me, uh, other people see us not as distinct individuals, but as obstacles and opportunities. And when you're an opportunity for somebody, right, they will make use of you. When you're an obstacle, they will attempt to go around you. And uh, to other people, individuals freely choosing what they want to do are potentially threatening.
right? So for example, just to stick to the example uh, that I gave earlier, I make dinner for my family every night. And if I just decided that I was done with that, if I just was like, you know, I don't like to cook anymore, screw it, then uh, that would actually be uh, an obstacle to uh, my family members. Now, now they have to do something that they weren't doing before. Uh, so others always have an interest. They don't necessarily always make use of this interest. They don't necessarily manipulate or try to control other people in, into uh, doing exactly what they want, but they always have an interest in certain kinds of behaviors on our part. One of the things as uh, liberty-loving individuals is that we want the world to go the way we want it to go. And when other people act in a certain way, that helps the world go the way we want it to go. And what that means is then that other people are both obstacles and opportunities for us, but others are always a threat to us because other people would rather that we made the choices that they wanted or that, they, that would benefit them. Uh, and there are going to be both overt, as in physical force, and very subtle, as in peer pressure, and maybe even completely uh, unintentional, unconscious uh, kind of uh, emotional manipulation that's going to play out. And society is full of these kinds of interactions between individuals. So a family is a great thing. And here I am, right? I have uh, two kids and a wife, and we're self-quarantined, and it's been 15 days, and basically the only world that we have right now uh, besides all the things that the internet and Netflix and Amazon can get to us, as far as human contact, we have only each other. And we are great supports for each other. Um, and I have an awful lot of empathy for people who actually don't have, who have nobody or who are living in uh, a, a situation where the, the, the people that they're around, they don't actually enjoy that They actually uh, either feel you know emotionally threatened by them or disappointed or whatever it happens to be. But we only we have each other and so we are for sure uh, providing a benefit but there's also a, a, an actual threat because here especially in this very confined tiny little society the expectations that other people have for how you're going to behave are going to be very powerful and it can be very easy other people would uh, would really prefer even if they wouldn't say it explicitly deep down would really prefer if you put them first instead of yourself first so if I just decided I'm like hey I'm just done making making dinner or like I'm done with this corn. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go camping uh, in the wilderness for the next six weeks and I'm just gonna be by myself uh, that's a threat to other people who are involved in these uh, in, in mesh social uh, um, arrangements with me and they and their desire to prevent me from making that free choice whatever kind of uh, disappointment or emotional manipulation or anger or actually physically barring the front door for me they are definitely a threat to me making my particular choices uh, for, for me, my free choices. So social liberalism uh, or liberalism as we see it uh, in terms of not what is the governing structure and what is our political system going to look like, but just in terms of what are our relations to other people is going to be uh, sort of dancing around this dual nature of others. Others are both a necessity and a threat to us. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, what's going to happen in the, this whole board of things? Obviously, I don't have a very big board. I don't have a whole wall of boards, so I'm going to have to do some uh, more erasing than I normally would. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to step aside. I'm going to let you see this, and then I'm going to erase. There are two other big domains in which uh, liberal, the idea of liberty manifests itself and takes part in or becomes part of the liberal family of ideas. And that is the economic realm and international relations. <clears throat> the idea of liberty in the economic realm is more, it's a more narrow version of uh, either the political or the social question. And uh, in the economic realm, economic liberalism is essentially uh, how do we make sure that people have free economic choices. What does it mean to make sure within the economic system that people's liberty is respected? And that is a uh, tough question. You would, you know, it, it, at first glance it might seem very simple. 
and there is a very simplistic, there is one simplistic way of saying economic liberalism just means that you never force anybody to engage in any kind of economic uh, behavior that they don't want to engage in. And that would be, if, if that were possible in human reality, that would be a really powerful uh, position. But it's when we make choices, economic choices, we make those choices within the context of a particular set of resources and opportunities. And uh, given the way those resources and opportunities might look and might be uh, distributed, we could actually, even though no one's grabbing our arm and forcing us to, you know, dragging us down to the Safeway and saying, you have to be a checker at Safeway right now. Uh, if no one does that, but if I get laid off from my job and I get an email that says that Safeway's hiring, uh, and I didn't get laid off from my job, but I did get an email from Safeway saying Safeway's hiring. If I get laid off from my job and I don't have any source of income and I'm going to starve if I don't make money and I see the Safeway's hiring and I'm like, well, I don't really want to work in a grocery store when there's a global pandemic. Uh, and when the you know, best recommendation for uh, not spreading disease and for not getting sick myself is social distancing, why would I want to go and work in a grocery store? Um, but it might be, given the resources and opportunities I have, I have no savings, I have no other potential for jobs, that I will go and do that job, even though I don't really want to do it. Now, that does raise a big question. Is that a free choice? Right? If somebody doesn't literally hold a gun to my head or literally grab my wrist and drag me down the Safeway and put the name tag on me and, and force me to work with a shotgun pointed at me saying, you're going to do this thing. If, we know that if somebody did that, if they, if they manacled you or, or held a shotgun on you or dragged you in there physically, we know you're not free. But I freely choose in one sense that my free will walks me down to the Safeway and I fill out the job application and, and, and I get the job. But Given the resources and opportunities that were available to me, is that a free choice? So part of what we want is we want free economic choices, and that's going to happen in the context of resources and opportunities. So part of what economic liberalism is going to look at is how do we make sure that the economic choices that people actually make are, in fact, as close to free as possible, or that we can say, yes, that's a free set of choices, even though that person, you know, like, I, I didn't really want to do that. But we make free choices all the time, there are things we don't really want to do. It's like, I don't really ever want to go to the dentist. It's not that I, I, I'm afraid of the pain, um, I just, I find it annoying, and, uh, you know, like a lot of people, uh, my experience is that as soon as they get that metal thing in your mouth, they ask you a question, and you're like, you can't talk. I find the dentist to be unpleasant. Um, if I, if, if, if I could, I would never go to the dentist. But I freely choose to go to the dentist because I recognize that that's just a short-term annoyance and the long-term benefit of going to the dentist is that I get to keep my teeth and I get to not have pain and all of the other things that we know about good dental hygiene. Um, so I'm actually uh, sort of sacrificing a short-term annoyance for a long-term benefit, and that's a free choice, right? Uh, but there's all kinds of things that can seem unfree, like when, I, when I'm actually going to the dentist, when I, when I get the calendar notice and I'm like, oh, should I have to go to the dentist? Uh, that, that I, for that brief moment, I feel unfree. But really, from the point of view of uh, really any reasonable vision of what liberty looks like, that's actually a free choice of mine. It's, that's, that doesn't mean that every time we willingly go somewhere, like willingly go, like I'm like, okay, I'm gonna willingly go down to Safeway and get a job. It doesn't mean that every time we willingly go somewhere that uh, we are necessarily free. Part of what economic liberalism is going to explore is connected to political liberalism. Uh, how do we set up a governing structure to govern the economy, to make to govern economic choices and economic structures so that people can be maximally free? There's also in uh, uh, economic liberalism, there's the need to, to sort of make an argument that this is the right way to organize an economy. Uh, political liberalism makes the argument that we, you know, are essentially separate from everyone else. We're prior to uh, the political system existing, and so there needs to be a social contract. With uh, economic liberalism, there's not necessarily automatically an argument that. Um, the way that we ought to organize our economic system. Because an economic system is obviously a system of cooperation and interdependence. It's obviously a social system. It's a, it, it's a situation where people are working together 
even if they're not personally collaborating. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cooperative system. So why should a cooperative system necessarily be governed by the, uh, the dominant uh, value of individual choice? So there's going to need to be that argument uh, made here. But part of the, the biggest question is, okay, how do we organize the sets of resources and opportunities to make sure that this is what we get? And of course, there'll have to be a conception of what it means to make a free economic choice. And next time when I talk about the different versions of liberty, this will definitely come up. Um, and I'll just tell you, it, sort of to, to, to preview that, <clears throat> there are really two different versions of free economic choices. And they have a lot to do with which way you lean in terms of resources and opportunities. One vision of uh, free economic choices is that unless you actually have the resources to have options laid out in front of you, then even if you choose something, it's not really a free choice. Uh, choosing among one thing uh, is not a free choice. Um, another approach to looking at uh, the uh, at economic liberty is more focused on opportunity to and essentially that you have the opportunity to choose. No one's no one is forcing you. This is the lack of force, right? The opportunity is like okay, you get to choose where to work, you get to choose where to put your body, you get to choose when to sleep, you get to choose what to eat, how to, uh, um, you know, what to think, what to read, all of that stuff. As long as you have the opportunity, as long as there's not force telling you, you have to do this, you have to do that, then you're making free economic choices. So there's a difference between saying, well, freedom is choosing among uh, available options, and if there are, there's only one available option, you're not free, even if you freely, you know, in the sense of like no one has a gun to your head, uh, freely choose that. Or the other view is that there are no obstacles to you doing what you want to do. There's no literal force or fraud that's forcing you in a particular direction. Um, so that'll definitely be something that, that we're going to discuss quite a bit. <clears throat> the Final domain that we're going to look at in this class is uh, the international uh, arena. And this is actually a relatively, compared to the other three areas of, of liberal thought, this is a relatively new one. This is really kind of a 20th century notion that the international world ought to be set up in a way that manifests the liberal values of uh, the political, social, and economic domains. And so basically this is kind of a, 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 co a correlate, or not a correlation or a collation, this is kind of a collection of liberal ideas and then an application of that to the international arena. And there is a thing called liberal internationalism which essentially says that the way the world ought to be organized is through a system of freely cooperating liberal democratic capitalist societies. Uh, and when we get to liberal nationalism in a couple weeks, uh, I'm going to talk obviously way more about what that, what that means. But the international domain of liberal thought is really a high-level development of all of the other ideas saying, okay, all of these liberal ideas, as we apply them to the political system, and as we apply them to the economic system, as we apply them to society in terms of uh, human rights, uh, capitalism, and a liberal democratic political order, these things are all good. And when we have a variety of nations that have those liberal structures, there's a kind of an international order that makes sense and that is beneficial and promotes peace and prosperity uh, and that that is the right way to organize the world. So if each of the domains is basically asking us the question, how do we manifest liberty as the primary value? Uh, and, the, the, and that's the sort of question, well, how, how do we manifest liberty as the primary value? In the political domain, it, we end up with, you know, spoiler alert here, we end up with a liberal uh, democratic system uh, that is, uh, you know, a rational social contract. 
In the social domain, we end up with a system where basically we allow people to choose what they're going to uh, do with their lives as long as they don't harm others. And we actually want to, want to in the societal uh, domain, we want to encourage diversity, eccentricity, individual experimentation. Uh, we want to reduce the power of, of things like uh, peer pressure and social disapproval. Uh, and certainly of, of outright political pun or outright uh, yeah political punishment for certain kinds of behaviors, uh, and in the economic domain we want to have a uh, free market capitalist system, either completely unregulated that's definitely one version of it, or uh, only regulated so that the choices people make are actually free choices. Uh, so that if there is any kind of government intervention in the economy, it's not to promote societal goals; it's just to protect. Uh, individual uh, free choice. And that might mean providing people with certain kinds of resources and opportunities uh, in order to make sure that their choices really are free. But it's largely going to be a, uh, a, a capitalist free market system with whatever level of uh, resources provided and whatever level of regulation is necessary to make sure that people actually can make free choices. Like for example, uh, you know, even, even the most hardcore libertarian recognizes that there ought to be rules against fraud. Right? If somebody prevent, presents you with uh, uh, false information about a product and you exchange your money for that product and you don't get what they promised, then you really didn't make a free choice. That's hardly different than if somebody held a gun in your head and said, give me your money and I'll give you this box of you know, marbles or whatever it happens to be. Um, if they say, oh, this, these marbles have magical properties that are going to make you immune to the global pandemic, and you're like, oh, that sounds good, and you pay your money, and that turns out not to be true, that wasn't really a free choice that you made. And so even the hardest core libertarian is going to recognize that there's some need for government in uh, the free market system. But essentially, the liberal family of ideas centers around a liberal democratic political system uh, that, that is the only really rational version of the social contract, a, a society of diverse free individuals who, while they acknowledge their connections with other people and they acknowledge the contribution that other people make, the individual is primary and we want to encourage diversity, individual choice, experimentation, even eccentricity, uh, and uh, that's how society ought to be organized, and the economy ought to be a capitalist free market system that is suitably rec regulated and or uh, subsidized so that people can actually make free choices because they have the resources and opportunities that makes them free. Liberal internationalism says, yes, put those things together, package those things together, and that creates for us a set of nations, units, that are all doing the utmost to manifest individual liberty in their best way, and that there's one other thing, which is that when nations interact in a particular way, when we set up these international structures uh, that are analogous to the uh, political system, the economy, and the society, that we can generalize these things, or I shouldn't say generalize, we can raise these things to a higher level of abstraction, and there's a way in which the global order can reflect the same underlying values of individualism, uh, uh, excuse me, of uh, individual liberty, even though we're talking about the interaction of nations as opposed to the interaction of individuals. So liberal internationalism takes liberalism and it essentially uh, raises it to the level of, uh, of na nations interacting as opposed to individuals interacting. And that's the liberal family of ideas. The idea that liberty is primary as applied to the political domain, the societal domain, the economic domain, and the international domain. And there are similar questions that get raised in all of these different domains, uh, but there are also very domain-specific questions that get addressed uh, as we attempt to apply the notion of individual liberty in each of these different areas, right? Society is different than an economy, is different than a political system, is different than uh, an international order of uh, interacting nation states. So there's gonna be some similar threads and there's gonna be definitely a different set of questions that get asked. So that's what we're gonna be doing in the first part of the course. And starting uh, with the very next video lecture, I'm gonna uh, look directly at the very first, historically the very first question that gets asked by liberalism, which is how can we justify having a government at all? And 
uh, what follows from that justification. What features of a political system are we going to uh, realize are necessary when we actually say we're going to take it seriously that we start off with no society, no government, and we are going to freely create that. But before we get to political liberalism, next time I'm going to discuss uh, the idea of well, what is liberty in the first place, right? Because we can come up with synonyms, it's freedom, it's autonomy, it's sovereignty, but what, what do those different synonyms mean? And I will preview this by saying there are different views on what liberty is, and there are two big categories. Uh, both uh, categories have good arguments and really make sense. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to pick one or the other, but one or the other will, when, when you go to answer more specific questions uh, within each of these domains, you will have to lean in one or the other of those directions. So that's going to be next time. I hope everybody's doing well and that uh, this whole remote instruction thing is going to work out for you. Uh, we will attempt, we will, I will attempt to create opportunities for us to interact more than just you sitting there either listening to the audio of this or, or, or watching this video. Um, but for now, that's it. Welcome to PoliSci 482, Liberalism and its Critics. I'm happy to have you along for this crazy ride.